Okay, so in this session I'm going to present um, content-based image retrieval. So this is the problem when you have an image and you have a database of images and you'd like to find similar images. Uh, we'll go into what it means in a little more detail uh, later on. Um, just to give credit, um, many of these slides were, were done by Ava Mohodano, so uh, these have been in the works for a while. Um, okay, so this is a sort of an overview of what we're going to cover. So start off by, by looking at what is content-based um, information retrieval, and uh, why, why is it challenging, and um, what are the challenges that are there. Uh, then we'll continue with looking at some of the classic ways that this has been solved. Like, so pre to deep learning, people solve this with uh, engineered features like SIFT and things like that. So we'll look at some of them approaches, uh, because they actually are still valuable and they can be combined with some of the new modern approaches as well, um, in, in various interesting ways. Um, after that, we'll look at you know, how to use deep learning for this, basically using a pre-trained network. And then finally, um, we'll look at learning representations for retrieval. Uh, there's quite a lot of slides here, so I probably won't get through them all, but you know, you'll, they'll be available afterwards. So we'll just see where I can get in the next uh, 25 minutes or so. So this is the problem, this is the setup, okay? So uh, basically, you're this guy here, and you have some information need, which I've represented as a bubble there, something in your head that you want. And you can somehow find an example of something like what you want, but maybe it's not exactly what you want. And you'd like to find similar things to that in a large data set of images. So you, know, you could be a search engine company, right? And you want to do what's called reverse image search, for example. So you want to take an image, find similar images. So your job then is to take your data set of images and and rank them, or equivalently, you know, give a score to every image and then sort by the scores, for example. Or or, and usually you don't want the whole database, I mean, you might just want the top 100 or top 200 or something like that, okay? So that's, that's the problem. Um, so why is it hard, okay? Well, there's, there's several challenges. Uh, the first one is to do with similarity, right? So how do you compare two images to say they're similar? I mean, if we could solve that, then the problem is close to being solved, right? Because if we can say, if we can have some function that takes two images and, and outputs a score for how similar they are, then we can just apply that to everything in our data set. Um, not worrying about scalability at the moment, but conceptually you could do that. And then you could take that score and then sort by the score. Okay? But it's not so obvious how you, how you define how similar two images are, right? I mean, what makes them similar? Um, we'll talk a little bit about that one in, in a little more detail. Uh, the second challenge we have here is speed. Okay, so what I mean here is that you know, we want to be able to return results to a user in some reasonable amount of time, right? Reasonable could mean less than a second, right, for example. And you can think about your search engine, you don't want to have a person waiting 10 minutes for search results, you want them to be fast, and you probably want to handle many users doing it simultaneously, right? So that, that's another thing. And then the scalability, right? If you're a big company, you have big image <coughs> data sets, you know, you might be interested in all the images on the internet, right? That could be billions. So we, we often want methods that can scale to huge numbers of images, and not just work on small toy con uh, collections. Okay, so they're the challenges. Um, so just to dr drill down on the comparing images challenge, right? So you can take an image, right, and you can flatten it out as a vector in any way you want, really, right? So you can say an image is a point in some high-dimensional space, and then you could say, okay, well, we'll compare images using, you know, either Euclidean distance or cosine similarity. So you can look at the angle between the two images. That's cosine similarity, or Euclidean distance is just what you think it is. And if you do that, you get very counterintuitive results, right? So, for example, you know, as we expect, the distance between the image and itself is zero if we're using Euclidean distance. But if you look at this one here, the distance between these two is 0.654, and the distance between this image and its horizontally flipped version is around the same, right? And I think we'd all agree that this is more different than this, right? So, your naive, you know, definition of similarity is not going to work very well, right? So, we need some better representation of the image in order to be able to compute similarity. So most of what I'm going to be talking about is ways of representing the image um, in order to make similarity more meaningful to, to us humans. Okay, so the earliest way people did this was using SIFT features, and it's still worth looking at how that works. Um, so here is the sort of classic SIFT retrieval pipeline, or just a, this is a general retrieval pipeline, and I'll show specifically where, where SIFT fits in in a second. So you have an image, right, and you can basically uh, compute some features from that image, right, some representation of the image. And you can do this for all images in your data set, right, and then if you want to rank the images, you just look at the distance between your query image 
and every image in your data set, and the ones with the minimum distance are at the top of the list, and the ones with the, the largest distance are at the bottom. Right? So that's conceptually what you do. Um, so in the classic SIFT pipeline, what people did was they would basically look at local SIFT features. So um, I guess people here have all heard of SIFT features, right? So SIFT features basically are an engineered representation to describe a local patch, right? essentially, high level speaking. Um, and if you can collect a lot of them from an image, right? And then you've got a sort of a variable length description of an image, right? Because you might have different number of features per image, right? And then you need your job then is to try and well, how do we compare this variable length representation of an image with another variable length representation of an image? And one way people tend to do that is somehow collapse the variable length representation into some fixed length representation. And the most common way of doing that is you, you cluster these features. So this is all the features for all your images, right? And then you have this set of clusters, and then you assign each feature to its cluster center, right? And that gives you a visual word, which you can think of as an actual word, like a token. So now your, your, your image is like a sentence, right? With all of these little visual words. Uh, order doesn't matter, so we can put in a, a bag of words representation. Or order does matter, right? But we can pretend it doesn't matter. Um, and then this is very similar to what you do with text, right? So this is called a visual bag of words approach, right? So you, you transform the image into a set of tokens, and then with these tokens, you basically create a, a, a vector that says how many of each of the tokens are in there. Most of this will be zeros, because you usually use a, a very, very high dimensional um, or a high number of clusters, which, which results in a very high dimensional sparse vector. Right? And this, is, this is basically how people did uh, retrieval before deep learning came along. Right? And there's, there's other variations on this, like, so you don't have to use uh, this visual word representation. You can use, there's things called Fisher vectors and um, all sorts of other things that sort of improve performance a bit. But the nice thing about this particular representation is because everything is, is most, most of the, the features are going to be zero. So Imagine you've got a million different visual words, right? Most of those words won't occur in any document. Um, so because most of them are zero, we have a sparse, basically a sparse representation. And sparse representations are really nice because they're really scalable, they're really fast, right? Because conceptually, once you have visual words, then your image is just like a document, right? And we know how to do search with documents really, really scalably at really, really high you know, numbers, like at internet scale, right? So we can do that, no problem, right? The tricks they tend to use in, in retrieval is something called an inverted file. Basically, that maps the words to the images that contain the words. And then you can find, you know, given a query, which ones are contained in this right, very, very quickly. So that allows you to narrow down the data set. And then there's usually a trick that people do at the end. So if you just do that on itself, it won't work very well. It'll work OK, um, because it doesn't take into account the locations of these things. And you know, if it makes sense that these two these points sort of match so what you can do is you can first of all rank things using what I said there, and then what you can do is you can take the top 100 or 1,000, or depending on your computational budget, um, matched images, and then you would basically sort of try to find um, images where it makes geometric sense that these things have matched, right? The, only, the reason you do this only with the top 1,000 or, or 100 images or whatever is because this is an expensive step, right? This geometric verification is what they call it, right? Um, I don't want to go into too much detail on it, but if you want to look up more information on it, the algorithm that's used is called RANSAC. You estimate a homography using like four pairs of points, basically. And then for every homography you estimate, you can see, okay, well, which points sort of follow that and which don't, and you can estimate inliers and outliers. And eventually you can basically come up with a score that re-ranks the top thousand so that you've got the best ones at the top, right? The best matches, right? And that's basically what people do. It's called spatial re-ranking. OK, um, so then how do we get deep learning into this? Well, I mean, the first thing you might try, and the first thing that everybody did try when deep learning came along, is, well, well let's take a pre-trained neural network. Let's say uh, this is an AlexNet. I mean, there's, you can take VGG, you can take a ResNet, you can take anything you want. And let's look at the last layer before the classification layer, right? Just We don't want the classes. We're not really interested in them. But there's usually something that comes before the classification layer that's like a linear step between that and the classification layer. Why don't we use a representation in there? And the intuition is that that might be good because it's at a semantically higher level than the pixels, right? Because as you're moving towards a network, you're moving towards semantics. The end of it is pure semantics, is what's meaning, is what's in the image, right? At the very start, it's pure pixels, right? So somewhere in between them two, there might be a representation that would be meaningful for us and that we could compare things in that space. That's the idea. So 
that was what people tried the first time. And they basically took things like AlexNet and took the features from the last layer. So you put the image in, you get these features, it's pre-trained, you don't do any learning, right? And you just use them and you start ranking with, with them features, okay? There's a couple of important tricks you need to make this work. Um, so the spatial sort of, the, the length of the vectors that come out of this can be very different, right? So one thing that people tend to do is to try and try to, first of all, project them onto a hypersphere, right? This is a very, very high dimensional sphere. You can think of it as a circle, right? Um, and that means that the, the, the absolute number of features doesn't matter as much. It's just how similar the features are. So it's this L2, PCA, L2 step, right? So L2 basically projects all your features onto the sphere. PCA basically makes the variance equal in all directions, and then that might get you off the sphere again, so you, you project back down onto it as well again, right? So this, this is a sort of a post-processing step that everybody does, and it basically improves performance. And the nice thing about that is that once you've got L2 normalized features, um, Euclidean distances become equivalent to cosine similarities, right, in terms of the ranking that you will get, right? So um, that's nice because then you can do, you can rank the whole, you can rank everything in your data set if they're all in a big matrix by just using matrix vector multiplication with the query features, okay? So that's, that's nice because you just do matrix multiplication, you get your rankings and you're done, okay? Very fast. Um, and you can do this both globally, right? So just one image in, get one set of features, or you can do it on different regions of the image, right? And if you do it on different regions of the image, it's extremely expensive, but you get very good results, right? So there, there's a bit of a trade-off there. Okay, so obviously the next thing you might look at, and this is exactly the way the research proceeded, was, well, now these were kind of easy to use, but what about if we try to use the features, the convolutional features, right? Not the, not the fully connected ones, these ones here, okay? So why might they be, be interesting to use? Well, there's a couple of reasons. One is that they're localized, right? So they have, you know, so the, these, this is a volume, and you can pick out a feature anywhere, and it corresponds to a particular area in the image, right? That, that's what the features are. So potentially, you can localize things with this, this approach as well. Um, and, you know, you could have different size images. They don't all collapse down to a fixed length feature vector. You can have different numbers of features coming out. And because we have local features, we can do the things that we were doing with local features before, right? So bag of words and all that kind of stuff, right? Uh, which you couldn't do when you just had, had these, right? Um, so one simple way, the first thing you can try with this is basically, so we have this volume of features. It's different depending on the size of the image. We'd like to collapse it into a fixed length feature vector, same way as we did with SIFT and stuff like that. So what, how do we do that? Well, the easiest thing to do is just try to sum them up over the spatial dimension, right? So just add up all the features or take a mean over the spatial dimension, right? Um, it doesn't matter whether you sum or take a mean, in fact, because you're going to be normalizing them afterwards, so it's all the same. Another thing people tried was you take the maximum over the spatial dimension of each of these features, right? So it looks something like this, right? So this would be max, right? So you, here are your feature maps, and then you just take a max over this direction, so you end up with a single vector that's the same number of channels as you had in the original feature maps, okay? And that's your representation. So that's quite compact as well, because you know, them, them sort of convolution layers usually have outputs of like 512 or something like that, right? So you get this 512 dimensional vector that represents your image, and you hope that contains the semantics, right? And if you do that, it will work reasonably well, actually, and just to, that's, a, that's a really simple way of building a search engine. I mean, if you do either of the things that we said, that, that I said there with you know, a ResNet or something like that, or a VGG network, You'll get a, and you make sure you have all the tricks and stuff in there, you'll get a, a, a decent search engine that gives you reasonable results, right? And this is something you can do in a collab notebooks in, in a couple of minutes, really. Um, another nice thing about this sort of convolutional features is because they're spatially localized, if I give you an image and I tell you it's, this is the patch that I'm interested in, you could potentially just extract the features from that patch, right? Because you just look at the part of the feature map that corresponds to the patch that you're interested in. Okay, so that's interesting as well. And that allows you to do what's called a local search. So you're given a query image, and then you can just search for the local patch, or you could use the context surrounding it as well, or you could use some combination of the two. Um, another nice thing about them, having these local features is that you can weight them, okay? So in other words, they don't all have to contribute equally to the final description. So imagine you're sum pooling them. You can add a little W in there beforehand, right? And that W can depend on whatever you want, right? So for example, you could weight them so that 
features near the middle of the image are more important, right? And the intuition there would be that, well, if I'm a photographer, I'm probably going to center the subject somewhere near the middle. Definitely not at the very corner, right? You might be doing something like rule of thirds or something like that if people know things about photography, but you can assume that the important stuff is usually near the center, right? Usually. And if you do that, you'll see this is the Gaussian weighting with a, with a center bias sort of weight. You see that it improves results, right, for this example. Um, you could also try weight on the strength of the convolutional features because they kind of have been seen to be like a type of saliency before, right? Um, and if you do that, you'll also get uh, slightly Im improved results over the first one, but not, the center bias seems to work a bit better. Um, and one thing we did recently was try weight them using actual computational saliency. So saliency prediction um, is when you try to predict where's the, where's the part in the image that people will look at, right? And you can train a separate network for that. You can then apply it to your, your image, right? And you can find out where the important parts are and then weight the features from there. And that works much better, right? You, especially for object databases because it really locks on on the object, right? And this can be done on the features and really, really improve your performance. Um, Probably worth mentioning, I said two things there. I said something like sum pooling, where you sum over the spatial dimension. And then I said max pooling, where you take a max over the spatial dimension. Um, and it's possible to generalize them concepts. They seem like are totally different things. Um, but, I mean, you can put them together, right? This is a, a paper here that showed that they're both sort of part of a generalized framework where basically it takes a formulation like this. So you let pk equal 1, and you get sum pooling, right? That just sums ev over everything, <coughs> dividing by the number of them in this case. But if you let the limit of this approach, limit the PK approach of infinity, um, then you'll see that this actually collapses to a max pooling, right? So one corresponds to some pooling, infinity co corresponds to max pooling. And then the obvious thing you might think as a researcher is, is there something in between them two that actually works better? Right? And these guys showed that there was. So here's a couple of experiments. Here are different, different values of P. And you know they get better results with some values of p, particularly p equal two and three and things like that. And then they also say, well, it's just a parameter. Why don't we just learn this from the data? And of course, you can do that as well um, and find out what the optimal p is. And in different experiments, they found different values. So this one, the learned one, was like 2.32. So you know, it kind of figured it out itself. Right? Um, another thing you can you can do with these sort of convolutional features is pool them locally. Right? So you can imagine having a sliding window over the convolutional features where you pool the features inside those, those windows. And then you get multiple descriptions for the, of, the of an image for different patches. And you can make these windows bigger or smaller, different scales, all sorts of different things you want to do there. You can generate a lot of local descriptions, right? And this is, ORMAC is, is the paper that sort of pioneered this sort of approach. Um, and there are the sort of details of, of what they did. Um, but essentially, yeah, just to, to look, go through it, it looks like this. So you, you take a, a window, and you slide it over the image, computing the features. You're taking the features that are computed once from the convolutional layer and pooling them at each stage. And then you get lots of different descriptions. And then if you want, you can sum pool all of them back together into one super pooled vector, right? But you don't have to. Um, you can basically keep the individual ones as well and then use them for spatial re-ranking, just like we did with the SIF features earlier on, right? If you do that, it's extremely effective, but not very computationally efficient, because you usually have 10 to 20 to 50 different patches per image that you compute, and that makes your descriptors 20 to 50 times longer that you have to store for every image, right? So there's always going to be a trade-off here in terms of you know, how, how quick you can do this versus how, how accurate and nice the results are. Right? Um, this shows the effect of doing that local sort of, using local information. Um, rather than using the global information. So on, on, on these two, on the top one, the top row of the top line there, you have using global. And then on the second line, you have using local. And the local stuff actually gives you a rough localization of where, where the object is as well. And in this case, I mean, you can see that the, these results here on the second line here look a little bit better, even though they're all marked as correct. On this line here, we actually get, get ones that, you know, it, it does dramatically improve the, the results. These are from the Oxford data set. Um, another method of pooling these features is to use what's called statistical pooling. So statistical pooling, you basically um, use some of the, the, the methods that I described earlier, like bag of words or Fisher vectors or, or various sort of statistical techniques that you can find that were often used traditionally, and just apply them to the convolutional 
uh, features. Um, so this is something that we, we started doing. Um, and we have a paper at ICMR 2016 that did this. Where we used the k-means clustering for them for the, on, this, on the local convolutional features and found that it worked quite well. And because we get this big sparsity pattern, we're doing the clustering, we have visual words. We can use, it's really scalable, right? Because you can use all of the technology that's used for documents once you've transformed an image into a, into a vector of words, right? So basically, you compute these words, and then you can plug the rest into a Google-type search engine that just does text matching or anything, any other type of text search engine, and you, know, you can get, get your ranking that way. Uh, so these just showed the results of this. And interestingly, in, in, in the harder data sets, this works a lot better, right? So you know, it, it's better but not so much better in the data sets like Oxford buildings and stuff like that, where the, the subject, the thing you're trying to find, is often really, really big, right? So it's a building, right? It's pretty much taking up the whole field of view. There are other data sets where the thing you're trying to find is quite small, like so. Here's the TrekVid instance search task, and sometimes you're trying to find something like that, or something like this, right? Where it's this like, logo in the corner or something. And this, this works much better for that kind of thing. Uh, I'll just skip along through this here. And then there's this paper here, if you want to check it out, it's sort of unif well, it's, it sort of takes a global approach of all of these and puts them under the one framework, right? So everything I've been saying, it kind of brings it all together, and you can, you can look at that if you want. Okay, so I just want to say a little bit about this, this part on, on learning representations for retrieval. Um, so what we've done so far is take a pre-trained convolutional network and then tried to use it for retrieval. And it worked better than expected generally, right? I think that it works quite well. But there's something slightly wrong about that approach um, because the network that you've trained for classification, right, that you're reusing for retrieval, has been trained to be sort of invariant to differences in the class, right? So, for example, it wants to see all of these things as the same thing, right? You're training it to make all chairs look alike, right? But in a retrieval context, you don't want all of these things to get the same score or same similarity. You, you want these chairs to be more similar to this chair than, than these chairs, right? But then somehow you, you, you haven't really taken that into account when you've been training for, for classification, right? So the idea is, can we do any better by training specifically for retrieval? And you can. Um, so how do you do that? Well, first of all, you need to set up some sort of regime and a loss function. So one of the early ideas in doing this uh, um, is to use what's called a Siamese network, right? So this is two, you can think of it as two networks side by side that share weights, or you can think of it as one network that you just pass two different images through, one after the other, right? Because they have the same weights then, right? Either way, uh, it's equivalent, right? And the idea is that what we would like is that uh, for images that are, you know, that should be matched, that should be of the same, you know, contain the same thing, for example, or should be close. Uh, the distance you know, should be small between these images. And for images that you know, are of different things or should be far away, the, the distance should be large, right? So we can take you know, pre-trained network here and here, and then we can fine tune it to try and make that condition hold. And in particular, we could use a loss function that looks something like this, right? Where we have, so this, can, this the loss here consists of two parts. The part on the left is the loss for a positive example. And when you see a positive example, you set this little delta guy here to 1, right, so that this part here gets activated and this part here goes to 0. Um, and when you see a negative example, you, you set it to 0 and then the other part, the, the right-hand side part, gets activated. Um, and then it, it consists of two parts, LP, which is a positive for your positive ones, and then LN is your loss for your negative ones. And for your positive ones, your, your loss is just the distance between them. You want to make that small for positive pairs, okay? So positive pairs are things that we want, want to bring together. And negative pairs are things we want to push apart, right? So for the negative one, we could use like the negative of this, but actually it turns out to be a bit better to use uh, what's called like a hinge loss. So in other words, if things are far enough apart, leave them alone. But if things get too close, they start to repel linearly, okay? So you can think about it that way. So this is kind of what it looks like. Things are far enough apart, right? We don't care, loss is zero. But as soon as we get within a margin, and this is a hyperparameter you have to configure yourself, right? So as soon as we get less than 10, you start to pay a penalty linear in, 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 that, in how close you are. So you can train with that and that will sort of improve your features. One thing to be careful about with this is that you tend to need quite a lot of data to do this. Um, and if you try to do it on a smaller data set, you get really good at that type of data, but then you might not be so good on, on other types of data. 
Um, and a final one I'll mention before I finish up is this one here. This is a, called a, a triplet loss, right? So this actually works a little bit better than what I said beforehand. And what you do in this case is you, ch you choose three points. You choose a point called an anchor, right? And then a positive example and then a negative example. And you can select them so that you're, it, the things are in the wrong order. So initially you select, it, you select the positive example that, that's further away from your anchor than your negative example. And you'd like to reverse that situation. You'd like the positive example to be closer and the negative example to be pushed away okay, from the anchor. And you can set up a little loss. This is a triplet loss um, that does that. So basically this just says that the anchor and the positive example should be at least alpha closer than the anchor and the negative example. Right? That's what you want. Um, so that basically reverses the situation. So to do that, you just need to, tra just to select triplets and, and train on them. Now, tr trying to do this in practice, the selection of triplets is, is extremely important because if you, if you ch choose them randomly, and um, what will happen is basically, most of the time your signal will be nothing, right? Your signal will be zero because most of the time you'll pick some, something that is already obvious for the network, right? That two chairs are, are closer together than, than a chair and a tree, right? What you, re you really want is to, to bring together, you know, some examples that are tricky, right? These are hard examples. So it's, it's crucial to pick the, the triplets carefully, otherwise most of your training, your, your gradient is nearly zero. It doesn't, it's not updating anything. There's nothing to do, you know what I mean? Um, so that brings on to how to get the training data for this. So one, one little, so it's, it's, it's pretty hard, right? So unlike classification, it's harder to do this because, you know, you have to make subjective calls on which is closer to something no, than, than something else, right? And that's kind of a harder thing to do um, rather than just saying this is a dog or a cat or whatever, right? Um, so you can get, you know, you can set up people, get, get people to do that manually, but that's quite time consuming. One interesting way of getting training data for this kind of thing is to, you know, take uh, images from, from Google Maps, right, from Street View and, and at different times and, and images that people have taken around that area. And then you assume that they're all sort of semantically similar because they're all from a similar location. And the things that are f in different locations are different. And at least for if you're interested in ranking buildings, this is going to work pretty well, right, because you're going to start bringing together things that are semantically similar from similar locations and pushing away things that aren't. Now, obviously, there will be noise. In this, you, you might get some, some photos that aren't of the right place or of somebody's dog or whatever it is. But, you know, most of the time you expect the thing to be right. And hopefully the network is robust to noise. I'll talk more about layable noise next week. Um, yeah, so, and another way you can do, you can do it is, well, well, we have kind of okay search engines based on SIFT, right? Let's use a SIFT baseline to collect examples and rank them, right? And then we'll, we'll manually correct any errors in that. And then we'll, so we do the semi-automatic process, and then we'll use that as our training data. That's a, that's a good strategy as well. Okay. Um, yeah, so I think I'm probably up on time, so I think I'll leave it there for now. So anyone have any questions on that? Pipelines, yeah. So when we say when I say pipeline, I generally just mean a sequence of steps that you use to to. Uh, so it's kind of I don't know where that term comes from, but a pipeline is essentially a sequence of steps. So you might first of all, step one might be resize the images until they're the right size, right? Say you want them all to be the same size to go into your neural network. Step two might be extract features, right? Step three might be in the pipeline might be pool the features in some way. Step four might be to do. Uh, L2 normalization, step five might be to do PCA, and step six might be to do L2 normalization again. And that would be your pipeline. It's like a function with multiple parts, right, that takes an image and produces some, some representation. Does that make sense? Any other questions? No? Okay, thanks. What do I do? Yeah, confirm. Confirm.